And now, here's your host of Shaping Success, Wes Tankersley. What is up, everyone? Welcome to Shaping Success. I'm your host, Wes Tankersley. We have an awesome guest for you today. Before we get there, please do a little housekeeping for me. Make sure you're subscribing to the podcast. Make sure you're subscribing to the YouTube. Turn on that bell. We want to get as many people as we can to realize what it is the show is about showing you and proving to you that success is generated by you. It's whatever you decide that it is. It doesn't have a cookie cutter definition like, hey, I got a lot of money. Hey, I got a nice car. Those are some things that might be helpful for you, but as long as you're doing the things that you love and enjoy and making yourself better every single day, that's what success is. Today, our guest is Alex Jarbo. He's a short-term real estate investor. We're going to talk a little bit about what that means, who he is, why he does it, and um, let's get right to it. Alex, thanks for hanging out, man. Good to see you. Oh, thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, you know, I get these notices in my email a lot, and I always have to kind of sift through them and decide, you know, do I want to talk to this person? Do I want to interview this person? Because I think that everyone kind of has to have an idea of the things that need to happen in order to be successful and whatever that that may be. And I, I kind of listen a little bit to some podcasts with you. I try to get a couple minutes just to kind of get a feel of who you are, but I want the questions to be authentic. So um, let's talk a little bit about who you are and where you came from, and then we'll talk about what you're doing now. Yeah, so um, and we can go all the way from the beginning. So I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, and then uh, I decided to join the Marine Corps when I was 18, right out of high school, went straight into the Marine Corps, served for four and a half years, and then the last year of my enlistment, I sort of just decided I didn't want to re-enlist. So I just started diving pretty deep into um, just different types of asset classes, whether it be stock market, just overall business books, real estate, and then real estate had really caught my attention um, just because I, I enjoyed the control that you could have over real estate. Um, so I originally joined a flipping mentorship and the gentleman that was in charge of the flipping mentorship, I realized all of his long term wealth was like tied into vacation rentals or short term rentals. Um, so I like immediately got him on a one on one call and I just asked him about it. He was very open with his numbers, showing me like what his cash flows were and stuff. And they were crazy compared to like some of the other like long term rentals or apartment investing or whatever I was studying. And um, he helped me choose a market, decide on how to choose a vacation rental market, which is um, the, the day I got out of the Marine Corps. I moved to where I live now, which is Asheville, North Carolina, and I uh, got my real estate license, started looking for a property for myself. It was about six to eight months of looking, couldn't find anything. Um, everything was either way out of my price range or it just wouldn't have done well. It, it was in my, if it wasn't, if it wasn't my price range, it just wouldn't have done well as a short term rental. Um, there was like nothing unique about it. Um, so I, again, like after six to eight months of looking, I f decided to build my first real estate investment. So like my very first real estate investment was an 800 square foot A frame that we own to this day. Um, ground up development from land to, to what we have now. And then one turned into two really quickly, two turned into four. And then uh, took, on, took on some investor capital after the fourth one. And then just right now, like today, we're developing $10 million worth of real estate and hoping to double that next year or trip, sorry, triple that next year. A development is kind of one of those things that, you know, so when we're talking about, so we're talking about one, right, which is just like you buy the property, you build it, whatever, and then you rent that out. And short term, just for people who kind of are talking about this, like a short term rental means like someone's going to live in it for what's the maximum amount they're going to live in it. I know? would say anything under 30 days, if you want to like really look at the textbook, like definition of it, it's like a, a vacation rental is categorized as like 30 days and under anything 30 days and over is considered like midterm. Like so rental. here in Boise, we have a lot of people who are building a house and they have to rent something short term. And usually people don't want to do a lease that's like three months, six months, 12 months. So people are staying in like an Airbnb for like 30 days. Yeah. Do you ever get kind of that stuff into your rentals? Not with the unique properties, man. And the unique properties, are I, I look at them as more like destination properties. Um, and they're also... I mean, they're, they're priced high. Like, I mean, we get good rates for them. So I, I don't really see anyone like renting those houses out for like, if they're just building a house or maybe just wanting to visit to check out the city, like for a month or two. So when you're developing, so we talk, you know, so you're saying the first one was just a single place. So you find a property, you build the house. Now you're developing like a whole, like 
it's not really a yeah, subdivision, right? It's it's an actual yeah, they're, like, kind they're of like, like a, they're like micro. I, I like to call them like micro resorts of like six to twelve cabins at the same time. So like we'll choose like a theme, whether it be a frames, cottages, chalets. We're playing around with tree. We're playing around with tree houses right now. Um, but we'll choose a theme and then build like six to twelve around that theme. So I'm I'm familiar with a frames and they're kind of cool. But you just said tree houses. <laughs> Let's let's yeah, talk so about tree, that a so little bit. Let, What's let, that going to look like? That. Yeah, yeah. Tree tree houses houses on stilts in the woods. That's that's the it's it's a safer route than just building like a house pinned to the trees or something. Because we're we're building like I say adult tree houses like they right. have full kitchens and full bathrooms. Um, but yeah, like houses suspended in the air um, that we market them as tree houses. Just really cool stuff. So how do you find that kind of property? Because I'd have to imagine like if you're going to build something out in the, you know, kind of like in stilts and you kind of want it in a wooded area where people it's it's basically like glamping, right? Like we're not we're, yeah. we're kind of camping, but we have all the stuff that we that we need and we're not really roughing yeah. it. Um, how do you find those areas? I mean, is it just like out in the middle of the woods? Yeah, so we're we're in the mountains here in, uh, in Asheville. So like we're in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, when I first started. I, I didn't I couldn't I didn't I couldn't invest in the city because it was too expensive. So I went to just like 15 to 25 minutes uh, away from the city. And when COVID happened, that sort of helped us a little bit because or a lot because a lot of people left the metro cities and went into more rural settings. Um, and that seems to be sticking true because our occupancies are still over 90 percent on all of our properties. Um, but yeah, um, it they're all in the woods when it comes to actually finding the property what i tell everyone that i teach on this stuff is um you want to be thinking about the entire guest experience and what that means is it's it's not just the property that the guest is staying at it's also the drive to and from the property that that's the entire guest experience so what i say is like you don't want your guests to be driving like 30 minutes up a gravel road before they even get to your property a lot of times they're driving in at night a lot of time they're new to the area. Sometimes they're like their cell phone reception is not that great. So you don't want them to be scared or annoyed or pissed by the time they even get to your property. Right. Um, so we like to be off of like a paved road um, to our land or some sort of like state maintained road. Um, so access access is like the number one thing I look for when it comes to that. And I mean, after looking at property for the last like five years, both on the computer and then also just in person, you, you, you get a feel for what would work and what wouldn't work for what you're trying to build. What we usually do is like, I'll have the floor plans already. And then, then I'll go look for the land. I'll have like the designs. I won't have like the foundation plans done or anything, but I'll have the design of the actual houses and the floor plans done. And that gives us an idea of what the land needs to look like for what we're purchasing for that specific property. So basically you go out, you start with a plan, like this is the house that we want to put on here. This is the unit that we want to put on there. Then we go find where it'll fit and, and yes. make sure that it has a good location. It's interesting yeah. that you talked about like, hey, we don't want them to be driving 30 miles up a dirt road because the first thing I think that people think about when they go out and they stay in that situation is, is how do I get to yeah. the civilian area? Like how do I get to the grocery store if I run out of something or how do I get yeah, to the doctor that, if that, I need that's to? That's huge when we're, look, we're looking at land. I mean, that's, that's probably uh, like if you're looking at amenities outside of the property, like that's number one is like, what's the closest grocery store? Cause that's where the, like I, in our check-in messages, like we, we tell the guests where the closest grocery store is so they can stop there before they even come to the property. Yeah. And, and that, that is, that's, I mean, that's important because you gotta, you know, if you need something, you gotta know where to get it. <laughs> right. It's not like they're out there hunting, killing their dinner and, you know, bringing it back right. and doing all those things. Right. <laughs> so you got into this development. So did you, you, you were talking about 10 units about is what your 10 to 12 units in this area. How big, how big of an area is that as everything planted is it within like a couple acres what's what's the space uh, yes yeah, so, yeah we, we go pretty we go pretty far out and that's also that also attributes to like so our local zoning and stuff um but i, I like my properties pretty sp uh, spread out so like the six acres that are the six cabins that we're developing right now um those are on 15 acres so it's, it's very spread out there is room for growth we'll probably do the full 12 eventually um so we're just starting with six yeah but anywhere between like 10 to 15 acres. And what I realized was the reason why I started doing these bigger projects, like I'd say those six are costing us anywhere between like 2.2 to 2.5 million once they're like turnkey everything. And um, what I realized was the best use of my time, instead of me going out and looking at one acre or like 
a two acre plot that I could put one or two cabins on. There was no difference in my time between looking at that two acre parcel or looking at a 15 or 20 acre parcel where I can do six to eight. The number was just bigger where I just had to bring on more inve- more investment capital. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. So you, so you talked about, you know, the first one basically was like a personal buy, right? So you bought, you bought the land, you built it, and then you built a few more, and then you started getting into the point that you needed investors. Mm -hmm. So your money from the first one carried over probably enough and you were probably, and I'm just guessing this is how I would think about it. Like you're able to take a loan on that one to build something else. And then you were able to take a loan on that one to build something else. And then now the rental revenue that comes in makes the payments on it. And then you reinvest again into something else to continue making that cash flow come in, right? Yeah, and I, I love I love giving numbers and examples. I'm pretty open with my numbers. Um, so that very first A frame man that we've owned for like five six years now, um, we built it for a 250 grand turnkey. So with the land, everything, I probably put 30 to 40 grand of my own money, and that money actually was borrowed from someone. It was just a, a, a close friend um, that I just paid like a simple interest rate to. Um, but I put 40 grand of my own money in last year, that property, like if you look at the January, to December, January, January, that that property grossed 82,000. And then it netted 46,000 after debt service after all expenses. So it's like the cash on cash on that one property, granted, that was prior to COVID. So you can discount those numbers by like 20 or 30%. Um, but that property made 100% cash on cash return. Um, just in, in the, like just last year alone. Um, so those are the numbers that you're talking about is like, we've just been, like you just said, like we reinvest most of the money that we make uh, in our properties into it. Cause I mean, my wife and I are cres- aggressively growing the business right now. So there's no point in taking all that money and just blowing it on something dumb. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. I don't know. I think, you know, my life, you know, as, as I grew up and I don't know how old you are, but I'm about 42. My parents told me when I was in high school, they're like, you got to go to college. You need to get a good job. You need to get health insurance. You need to basically take no risk and yeah. and just know that you're comfortable and you're okay, right? And I I thought about that for a while. You know, I went to college. I failed the first semester and decided to go into the work sector. And I became a, you know, I, I was actually a mechanic. I, I changed tires for a living for 11 years and I made really good money. And but I work for someone. I had health insurance. You know, they get you sucked in and they're like, you're not going to find anything that you're going to get paid this much. You're not going to find yeah. benefits. You're not going to find all these things. So you have that choice of being comfortable or taking a risk and having a chance to have more, right? And so that's kind of the 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 switch that you have to have in your head that there is availability to make more or to be more or to have more, but you have to be willing to take that risk. Was it tough to take that risk? Oh yeah, absolutely, man. And, um, I, I talk, so like my, my parents weren't against me joining the military, but they were worried, right? Like 18 year old kid grew up, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, but that I I had a, a a relatively successful military career. Like I, I, I made a name for myself really, 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 I did really well in the military and, um, my parents could not understand why I was leaving. So it's like you, you, you built a really good life here and like you built a really good foundation to take you the 20 years or whatever time I was going to stay in if I reenlisted. Um, they, they couldn't understand why like I was leaving that. And I mean, they, they were partially right. I mean, it, it's the same thing. Like I have the health insurance, I had a, a, a solid foundation that I built right. for those four and a half years. And uh, to just essentially be like, okay, I'm starting over at like the age of 22 and move to a city that I didn't know anyone, any connections or anything. Um, Yeah, I mean, that was terrifying. But looking back at it now, like that's what shaped me during those times, because I think about I think about those times, all like those first two, three years, all of the time. It's like, look around now. and It's like my wife and I have a beautiful house that we live in. And it's like I would have I would have never imagined where we are now in the five, six years compared to like where I was like two, three years ago. And so now, now you're, you're developing stuff and you're building more and more. And what are the plans for that? Just to continue, just keep growing it, keep building it. Yeah. So I would like to get to, we're at 13 units here and then we're putting on another 24 in the next year. That's where the 10 million is coming from. Um, I think I'm going to get to either 50 to 70 properties in this market. And then 
I'm going to start looking at uh, other like mountain markets. I like mountain markets because they tend to be a little bit less seasonal than like beach or lake markets. I want to say mountain markets, not necessarily like ski mountains or not like skiing resorts or anything. It's more like just like like the Blue Ridge Mountains are just a mountain market. There isn't like ski towns. There are, but it's about like an hour away. So I think that's the next step is to venture out into other markets. And then I would love to get into like some sort of boutique hotels as well. So like boutique hotels anywhere between like 12 to 36 units that we do like a condo conversion into like a boutique hotel essentially. So let's talk a little bit, you know, like for someone who wants to get into this or for someone who's mm-hmm. thinking like, you know, hey, I, I have I have some money saved, but I don't have enough. Like you mentioned that you were able to leverage what you had or borrow from someone. How did you go about that? I mean, was it a family friend? Did you reach out to people? Hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Did someone have to buy in? What was what was the process there? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think I, if I remember right, it was only like 15 grand that I needed because I did have some money saved up. Um, but yeah, it was just like a 10% simple interest that I was going to pay him back in like a, two years, essentially, which I did um, just from the cash flow. But yeah, I just approached them, showed them what my projections were. And um, yeah, I didn't bring them on as a partner or anything. Um, for people who are looking to just start um, a really cool, we, we also buy properties that have some land attached to them where we can develop more properties. Um, so that, that's a pretty good entry point. If you can find like a small little cabin or a small tiny house that has like maybe one to three acres attached to it, um, you can operate that one while it throws off some cash flow, and then you can develop more properties like on that land. Another thing you can do is when I first started short-term rental loans, didn't really exist. Um, now they exist through a lot of different companies, um, especially the, the, the short-term rental construction loans. But you can get a second home loan, uh, a second home construction loan, depending on where you live in your market. And you can you can leverage that to build your first short term rental, which is what we did. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing that people get hung up on or get scared about is what if I don't rent it? What if I don't make money on it? Yeah. You know, and, and I so think that's that's the first question I asked myself with that. So we originally before COVID were, were ru- like uh, running the numbers as long term rentals. We would underwrite them as long term rentals. And if that didn't work, we would just sell them for for the for the square footage that we're I'm talking about here, anywhere between 500 square foot to 1600 square foot. That square footage number will always be desirable. That's like a if you were to sell that as a normal house, because all of our houses are permanent foundation stick built houses. So like you can a a different person can come in, a, a buyer can come in and purchase it as a normal house and get a normal home loan on it. So that's the exit. So if people are scared about, okay, maybe this doesn't rent out or maybe the regulations change in my city. What if that happens? You can just sell it as a normal house. And I'm I'm sure you're going to make some sort of profit because like all of our properties, I'm pretty confident that a couple or like a small family can come in there and purchase that property because affordable like that. I consider that like affordable housing in the 500 to 1600 square foot range. And there, there will always be a need for affordable housing. Yeah. And that's, a, you know, it's funny because we're talking about the And you said you're in North Carolina. Is that where you are? Yeah. Asheville. Yeah, Asheville okay. North Carolina. So you're in North Carolina. We're in Idaho. So like I'm, I'm all the way on the other side of the country. Okay. Um, but we have an influx of people coming in here. And those houses that you're talking about, those sizes, those are the highly desirable ones. And it's making it so that we have a lot of people who are moving from out of state that are coming up here, working out of state, making out of state wages but living in a place mm-hmm. where that house that was 1,600 square foot, I bought one 10 years ago, was $117,000. And now it's a $400,000 house. Yeah, so right, right. That's a, that's, a tough, that's a tough sell right there. And so it's interesting when, you know, those are the ones that are in demand. Now, when you start getting any bigger than that, and your exit strategy is to sell that if it's not making you the money that you need, now you have a, a niche market that's got to be smaller, right? And you're going to have a harder time unloading something that's that, that, that's that big or that size. Right. So coming to, coming to your investor, you know, you were talking about like, hey, you know, you needed a little bit of money for that first one. You went with a plan, right? You told them what the projections oh, yeah. were. You had this, this, this plan of where it was going, what you were doing. Was it on paper or was it just a verbal thing? Or what did you, how did you prepare oh, yeah, them yeah, for yeah. that? No, I mean, I... Yeah, I treat investor money probably five to 10 X, but like a, a dollar to uh, my dollar is like 10 X to like a, an investor's dollar. Like that, that's the mentality you have to have when you're taking on other people's money, whether it be friends, family, strangers, whatever. 
Um, so yeah, I came to them with a plan of pro forma projections, where those projections came from. And um, yeah, we just, uh, it, it had gotten to a point where on top of cap, it, capital wasn't necessarily the issue. It was more, um, I couldn't guarantee any more loans in my name at that time. Uh -huh. So that that's that's what part of the investor part of the investor relationship was guaranteeing the loan on top of them bringing most of the capital to the table as well, because if I mean just just having it, like someone guarantee the loan, I didn't want to bring on most, multiple investors. So I was like, I want to find someone that can guarantee the loan and bring all the money to the table, and then I'll, I'll operate. I'll take care of the entire development and operation and everything. Yeah. So if you don't have a lot of money, I think one of the biggest things that I'm trying to get at is that if you don't have a lot of money. And you can't, like you said, you had taken out the maximum amount that you could take on the loan. So now you have to try and find it a different way because a bank is not going to give you that money. You find investors and then you treat them just like you treat the bank because you want them to know that they can trust you and that their money is going to get back to them and it's going to get there, right? Yeah. yeah so yeah, that, absolutely. So learning how to do that, now you've done that one time, then you do it a second time, then you do it a third time. Now you can go to bigger investors, right? And talk to them about yes. building something bigger. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's exactly what we're doing right now. So both building and we just went under contract for seven cabins uh, that has like 10 acres attached to it. And that one, I mean, again, I'm pretty open with my numbers. That one's uh, probably going to be a $2.5 million purchase. And outside of the due diligence costs that I'm putting in for inspections or anything, I'm getting all that money back at closing. So I'm putting none of my own money into these deals anymore outside of me actually paying for the inspection. But once once closing happens, none of my own money is tied up into these own deals. And I'm, I'm getting about like a 20, any, depending on what the deal is, anywhere between 20 to 40 percent of the entire ownership of the deal. Yeah, which is crazy. And I'm putting yeah. none of my own money into the deal. And do you have an option yeah. to buy them out if they decide that you that you that yeah. they decide yeah, they don't want to invest anymore? We're, we're keeping the investors with us pretty long term on these. So like I, I've teamed up with a couple syndication firms, one's out of Michigan and one's out of New Orleans. Um, that they they I, I I did a big capital push last year or early this year. Um, but I, I I feel like the best use of my time and where I'm really good at is putting together these deals myself um, and then having someone else handle the the investors. Um, the investor relationships, because that's a, that's its own world completely okay. with regulations and everything. So, yeah, I mean, exactly what you said. I started with just I started with a military friend. Initially, we built two cabins together, um, moved on to a local friend here um, that that has was born and raised here. And then my third investor, which was a JV deal, was a gentleman that lives here. That's a business owner. And then I the after the third or third one. That's where we went into the the syndication fund um, stuff, but it's the same, it's literally the same structure for the most part. Outside of the syndication fund, it's they're bringing all the money, they're helping me guarantee the loan, and then I get some sort of ownership in the deal. Yeah, and with so we'll talk. I just kind of want to talk on the micro because, like, I think yeah. like we'll talk about the first one a little bit, and then where you are now. But like the very first one, you know, what kind of besides besides buying the property. How invested were you in like the construction and all that stuff? What what did you have? What terms of, you know, you, did you have to be there all the time to help watch them, make sure that it was? Was it just basically, hey, we build it and and then we take it and we go? How, how did that work out? Yeah, so I have I have a GC. I'm a developer, so I have GCs that work for me. So um, depending on how much you trust your GC and how much, how much, I mean, that also plays into your management style overall, but um initially i was only going out there maybe once a week once we first closed on the property um that was just me not knowing what to do like what i was doing um if you if you have faith that things are getting done or if things are getting done which establishes trust with your gc right. um you can I, i've left my gc to do their own thing for like a month at a time where i wouldn't go on site for an entire month um as long as i'm getting as long as I'm getting pictures and updates, I really don't care. I don't have to be on site. Now, if things start going wrong and things are starting getting delayed, yeah, I'm, I'm on site maybe once a week, maybe three or four times a week, depending on how delayed things actually are. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, you can manage these things remotely if you're traveling. You just ask for pictures and videos. Yeah. And as yeah. far as like the... Um with COVID, because you mentioned that now, did you were you building during COVID or how has that bought like here it's like you can't get anything like refrigerators are six months out well it's getting better but it was terrible you yeah. know like i'd walk into a house so i i sell window coverings <laughs> during the day so i sell blinds oh, and shutters yeah. and shades and stuff purchasing windows first and just storing them like yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah 
And that's what you have to do, right? Like you, once you realize that this is what's happening, you got to buy windows, you got to buy, you know, the refrigerators, you got to buy the things that you know that are going to take forever to get, even though you have the plans, you have all the sizes, you have all the things you need and you could just go with it. Yeah. So we had, we had budgets that got caught up in between before COVID and after like during COVID. Um, so we, we held off on those for about like a year and a half or two, because there was no way, like we we would have blown our budgets by 150 grand at least on some of our projects. Um, so I transitioned into purchasing, um, properties during like the middle of COVID before things got really crazy. Um, when I took a little bit of a hiatus for about a year where we, we were still able to do stuff like site work. Um, but we held off on like concrete foundation and, and actually building. Um, but I mean, I just, I just fine tuned my business model in those like six to eight months where we weren't actually building. Um, and then there was, there was a weird time about like three to six months where like nothing really was happening, um, in terms of me purchasing or building. Um, but, but again, I was just fine tuning my business plan because we did, we did go under contract on some properties right when COVID happened, um, where things before things really took off, where it was a cabin where there was some land attached to it. And I was like, once things cool down a little bit, cause there's no way they're going to stay at these numbers, which they aren't. Uh, that's where we can start building on on these like these parcels that that have the cabin on them, and that's what we're doing right now. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, and now like it's it's interesting because like now we're things are getting better. It's easier to find stuff. Labor is getting a little bit cheaper. Materials are getting a little cheaper. But then we we're playing around with interest rates now. But I, I'm telling people like even if the interest rates are seven eight percent, don't discount investing no matter what you're doing like it doesn't have to be real estate don't discount investing completely just because we're going through a correction right now like still underwrite the deal and see if it'll cash flow or not yeah yeah and i mean that's the other thing though to think about too is like with what you have going now is that even if even if you stop right where you're at right now and you have people who are renting these these rentals you're going to continue to have income rolling in if you have to wait a little bit for it to turn around before you start building or prices to go down because the economy has been this way our entire lives. It's, it has its highs and lows and we had a really long high and now we're, we're getting that low again that just so happens to be wrapped up with the stupid pandemic. (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. It's like one punch after the other, but you just got to roll with it. Yep. So what, what are you, are you, you you know, you mentioned a little bit like you went and you had a mentor. Are you teaching classes? What are, what is your long-term goal with like getting more people to invest or what are, what are you, what are you here for? Why do you go on podcast and, and share your story? Yeah, I mean, I've been um, I've been trying to get my story out there. So the the easiest way I've been doing it is honestly, I've just been documenting stuff through YouTube. So I have a YouTube channel that um, I, uh, I like to, people to hop on. Um, we I recently put together a short term rental development course. Um, it took me like six months to put together, but um, I had a lot of people coming to me and asking me, "Oh, how do you do this? I'd love to work with you." And I just didn't have the 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 time to take one-on-ones um, even right now. Um, so that's why I put the course together. I essentially put a course, I put the course that I wish I had together when I started six years ago. So ever I brain dumped everything. So it's over, it's over 120 videos. There's workbooks. There's some group coaching in there, like once a month, like group coaching, Q and A and all that fun stuff. Um, and th- that, that lives on my personal website, which is alexstravo.com. Okay. And so you're, so what you basically, what I like about this is that you're not afraid to share what you're doing. And it's not a, like, you're not worried that someone else is going to come take your idea, right? There's plenty of, there's plenty of pie for everyone. And especially for real estate, man. Like there were no A-frames that were on the Airbnb market when I first started, uh, when that first A-frame was built. And now there's probably eight of them, 10 of them. Who cares? Like it, my occupancies haven't been affected at all. It's just, nine other properties that people can rent, like compared to the thousands that are in the market. Um, yeah. So like, uh, yeah, it's like a lot of our ideas for properties come from other properties in different markets, whether it be internationally or here, that uh, real estate's so, so micro niche, like to your specific market, to your specific area. It doesn't matter if you're built, if someone takes my ideas or whatever, like I, that, that doesn't affect me. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's yeah. kind of the thing, you know, like I've always been the person, like even like in a management position that share your knowledge with other people, because yeah. those people need to know how to do that. And you like, to me, success is like, I'm more successful if other people are successful as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. And all of the all of the success I've had in the last like with things really took off like two three years ago um, was when I started sharing my journey when I started hopping on podcasts when I started doing the YouTube channel. Most of the relationships I have established now uh, on the short term rental and business side have all come from just sharing my story. Yeah. So if I would have just like we call it in the military, like you're your like don't be your own island. Don't just live like just keep everything to yourself. And I was definitely like that for a couple of years because I was just like paranoid. I didn't want like maybe my neighbors to see what I was working on or blah, blah, blah. But like that that stuff was just unfounded stuff that just never happened. It was just stuff I was just worried about that was just just made up in my head. Yeah. Well, and I think it's awesome, you know, that you were in the military because I think that that always kind of gives me like I, I never I never joined anything armed forces wise, but I was in sports and I feel like you're kind of on this team and, and everyone relies yeah, right. on everyone and you learn how to be on time, how to be scheduled, how to do the things that you need to do and have, you know, that tunnel vision towards your goals. And I, dude, I've said that so many times about like, that's the, I think that's the biggest thing that people struggle with. And I'm sure it's the same thing when, if you're coming from organized sports as well, it's like when you leave that when you leave that structure and you're like, okay, like, okay, this is awesome that I have all this free time, but sometimes that could be a bad thing because you have no yeah. structure and it's, it's on you to create that structure. Yeah. You got to have a yeah. plan because that's like you said, that's, that's, I, I think a lot of people, I have a friend who has been on my podcast before who talks about that. That was the hardest thing for him because he planned on being a career military person and then he got medically discharged. And once you, once that happens, it's like, they're not going to let you back in. They medically right. discharged you. And now you have to have a new identity. You have to figure out what you're going to do. Yeah. It's like here, you just, you just built yourself up for as long as you were in. And it's not that that stuff doesn't matter when you're getting out, but it, it doesn't matter as much. You're not around that same group of people. You're not, you're not in that structure anymore. So you do have to rebuild yourself. You have to, you have to put some sort of structure in your life where like, if, if you're, if you're working on your own business and you don't have like a, a like a job or anything, um, it, that falls on you. I, I look at my schedule every night, every week to make sure, and I'm, I'm planning my own schedule out. So it's, yeah. it's not, it's yeah. Well, it's I fun. have to say you're, you're pretty organized because I know like I was looking at, I, I have, I check in on the day of the podcast with people. I should probably check in a little bit sooner. And you brought up something that was, I need to make sure that it pops up. The, the link pops up when, when it goes onto your calendar, because you have the ability to do that. But there's a lot of people who just look at that and they're like, eh, who cares? You know, like, okay, it's scheduled. I know it's scheduled and, and, and that's it. And I kind of look at that as like, I'm grateful when people know that they, that they're here. Well, no, I'm, 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 I'm hopping on your, I'm hopping on people's podcasts before I'm even going on just to check it out, reading the bio and everything. Like, no, that's super important. You're, you're helping me. I mean, you're helping me with my business the same way I'm hopping on this podcast. So yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing your story. Um, is there anything else that, that I, that you would like to talk about before we go? Um, you know, you mentioned you had a website again, if you want to say that again, so people can hear that. And is that the best place to find you? Yeah. Uh, Alex Jarbo.com, A L E X J A R B O.com. That's where you guys can find my YouTube channel. There are some previous interviews I've done. Um, and then the course, um, is, is like just a button just right at the top that you guys can sign up for. Um, YouTube is, channel is a little, uh, Alex, it's called Alex builds. It's a little blue tree house. That's what the logo is. Um, if you just type in Alex builds into the, the search bar, I'm sure it'll come up. And then I'm pretty active on LinkedIn as well. Um, for people who are on bigger pockets, I'm a short-term rental blog writer for their, I'm a blog writer for their short-term rental content. Um, oh, so awesome. I'm pretty active in the comments section there too. Writing, you know, that's the one thing that I don't do. I do all the verbalizing. I mean, how, how's that treat you? <laughs> It's good, man. Um, I, I was very fortunate to be presented with that opportunity to write for them because they're like the biggest short or real estate blog community in the country. Um, so a lot of really cool stuff has come from that as well. Um, yeah, the the blogging is. I um, when when I when I came out of the military, I got my undergraduate, my MBA, and then I'm finishing up a doctorate right now. Oh, and dang. I, I've I've learned to like writing. I mean, it's just like, yeah, yeah, it's just like. It's same thing with the structure. It's like there's a structure to my blogs. They're not really that long, maybe a couple pages long. Um, yeah, but it sucks. That's definitely the hardest thing I do. Writing's hard, man. 
It is. It's, I, I never really enjoyed it, but I'm a really good BSer. So I was, I have a master's degree too. So, you know, I, I did what I did and then I went back to school and real and became a teacher. And I was like getting my master's while I taught for four years. And when the fourth year rolled around, I was like, I'm out, I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah, but, that's, uh, that's how I feel, that's how I feel with my doctorate. I'm in the dissertation portion just getting torn apart. I'm like, ah, I don't know. I don't, why am I doing this? <laughs> yeah. Well, sounds like you've had a pretty good career and you know what you're doing. So I, I appreciate I appreciate you taking the time to come come on and talk to us about it. Oh, I appreciate you having me on, man. It's been fun. All righty. Well, we'll have to do it again. <laughs> All right. Thanks, man. Yep. Thank you very much. All right, everyone. Thank you for hanging oh. out and, and uh, listening to the show or watching the show wherever you are. Remember, don't forget to subscribe so that we can get more people here. Um, watch the videos. Let me know if you have any questions. Great conversation about short-term real estate investing. Hopefully that you got some information there. Alex is awesome, dude. Until next time, I challenge you to find the shape of your success.